1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. If you found that in your Bible, stand with me. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put it on the screen because I want you to see the Word of God as you hear the Word of God. Earlier in our service, we read the Word of God. I want you to see the Word of God, hear the Word of God, speak the Word of God when we do this responsive reading earlier. Right now, if you'll just follow along in your Bibles or follow along on the screen as I read this passage, we're thinking about Christian liberty and concern for one's spiritual well-being. We began looking at this last Sunday. We've been looking at Christian liberty for several weeks now, but we begin this, this particular passage last Sunday, part two today. We'll only get through chapter 10, verses 1 to 13, but we'll, we'll tackle it, okay? Verse 24, chapter 9. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body, keep it under control, lest having preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. We talked about that last Sunday. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. You must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. That's what we're going to study today. Read verses 14 and following just to sort of think through the passage and anticipate next week. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Pretty potent passage. We'll be trying to take it apart and put it back together so we understand it for ourselves. We just read together what though? The inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to understand this picture of Christian liberty. When when Christ saves you, when the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. And you may may run in this field with pleasure and joy in Him, always mindful that there is a fence around it called the fence of self-denial. May the Lord help us to take that in, practice it toward one another and to a world that desperately needs Him. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, in our Bibles, chapter 9, 24 to 27, uh, then ends, and chapter 10 begins. Remember, though, when the, when the New Testament was written, this is also true of the Old Testament, by the way, there were no chapter breaks. Those chapter breaks have been put in to, to sort of contextualize a flow. This is one of those places where a chapter break may not be helpful because the thought is still the same. Paul hadn't changed what he's thinking about. He's, he's shifted emphasis a little bit, but he's still thinking about what he was in chapter 9, verses 24. Now, Christian liberty needs to be expressed in a way that is beneficial to one's spiritual life. If you, if you mistake liberty 
for license to do whatever I want to do, that's dangerous. Your soul can be in jeopardy for that. So don't, don't let the chapter break fool you. The discipline and determination that characterized Paul's life found no place in the lives of many of the Israelites who followed Moses out of Egypt. They had been shown many special privileges, many advantages. And in the face of that, they gave in to idolatry and lust and presumed upon the favor of God. And as a result of that, suffered disaster. So Paul uses Israel's experience to warn the Corinthians, the believers in Corinth, not to, take, not to make the same mistake. They were not to see how far they could go before God would punish them. You know, some children do that as they start growing up. You say, well, the boundary is here. And they say, well, is this okay? The rebellious spirit. So he warns the Corinthians. They were not to test the forbearance of the Lord and the mercy of the Lord. They were to follow the ways that were right. And so one writer said, when you approach this passage, see it as a solemn warning against complacency. We talked about that last week. And overconfidence. The notion that because I've been saved by the Lord, now I can live however I want to. That's not what salvation is. When you're saved, your want to is fixed. When I've been saved by the Lord, then I want to live in a way that pleases God. And my wants, when they come into conflict with his, my wants bow. So remember this passage, I want to just really quickly, 9, 24 to 27 was about the experience of Paul. What we're looking at today is the tragic example of Israel, 10, 1 to 13. Then next week, Lord willing, the perilous situation of the Corinthians in chapter 10, verses 14 to 22. He begins this discussion in chapter 10, verse 1, about these privileges that our forefathers, the, the generation brought out of the bondage of Egypt, he talks about that. He uses this word all. All. Look at this a minute. In chapter 10. Our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual or one, one version says supernatural food, all drank the same supernatural or spiritual drink. All, 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 this generation, this, these millions of people who were released from the bondage of Egypt by the sovereign hand of God showing his might that he was greater than anything Egypt had to offer. He was greater than Pharaoh, Pharaoh, the, the human manifestation of the sun god. God is greater than that. And on that last plague, the death angel, God passed over. We talked about that last week when we had the Lord's Supper. He passed over any Israelite home that had blood painted over the doorpost, the blood of a lamb. He passed over that. And he slew with sovereign majesty, the firstborn in every home that did not have the blood. Have you ever stopped to think about what the, what the wailing and weeping sounded like in Egypt that night? Even Pharaoh could not protect the life of his firstborn son, and he could not bring him back to life, which was the kind of reputation he had. Couldn't do it. This generation was delivered from that. And so he's talking about here about them coming out from that. They were all under the cloud. Remember the cloud? We talked about that before. It's when, they, when they headed into the wilderness, this cloud formed over them during the day. When you, when you walked in the Sinai Desert during the day, it was unbearably hot. If you've ever been in a, in a desert like that, you know that when the sun goes down, oftentimes it, it, it gets unbelievably cold. A stark contrast of weather. So God appears in what they would come to know as the Shekinah. 
And as, as in, in cloud form, he hovers over them during the day. They traveled, remember, they didn't, they didn't say, well, we've gone far enough today. We need to, no, no, they traveled as long as the cloud moved. And if they were moving during the day and, and night fell, the cloud turned from a, from a cloud of comfort, keeping the sun from them, to a pillar of fire, warming them. And when the cloud stopped, whether it was six o'clock in the morning, whether it was midnight, when the cloud stopped, they stopped. And they were instructed when they stopped, because they were marching in a procession, three tribes uh, to, the, to the west, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the north, three tribes to the south, the Ark of the Covenant in the middle, carried by the, by the Levites. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. They placed the Ark down right where they stopped. And they assembled the tabernacle around the ark. It had to be a spectacle to see. But they didn't, they didn't march for days at a time. For 40 years, they built their lives around the ark. Paul's talking about that experience. So he says, they were all under the cloud, under the guidance of the cloud, under the protection of the cloud. They all passed through the sea. Now he's going to take these two experiences and use the term baptism, which is fascinating. I mean, there's a whole study in this about this, about how Paul uses baptism here. So they, all of them experienced however many, however many million there were. The cloud covered all of them. The Red Sea parted. The waters were held back. Nobody got their sandals muddy. They walked through on dry ground. And think about it, every step of this was miracle. Every step of this was marvel. None of this made sense, humanly speaking. Even if they'd seen a creek bed dry up, they would have anticipated getting mud on them walking through. But no, no, this, the Red Sea parts and they walk on dry ground. Clearly, obviously, moving under the protective care of Yahweh. So he says, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud. And in the sea. The word baptize, we were talking before, is the word baptizo. So it's not, when it comes to us in the English, it hasn't been translated from the, from the Greek. Baptizo, baptize. That's unfortunate. If they'd have translated it, it would have been baptizo, immerse. That's the picture here. You cannot read this and think they were all sprinkled in the cloud. They were immersed under the cloud. They were all sprinkled in the sea. They walked past walls of water and were, and were literally under it. So it's not, the, it's not the getting wet issue here. It's about the being immersed in a reality. And the idea of being baptized into Moses is, is they followed Moses as God's appointed authority. We, talk, we ask questions when we put somebody in the baptism up here, the baptistry. Is it your intention standing here that you intend to follow Jesus Christ all the days of your life, submitting to his lordship? Yes, that's the picture. They follow him as Lord, under his authority. They're, so these people were following Moses, recognizing him as God's appointed authority as they move through this experience. Goodspeed, one of the commentators, said all, as it were, accepted baptism as followers of Moses. And, and when Paul writes this, by the way, he's thinking of Moses as a type of Christ. So the Israelites, by participating in this whole Exodus event, acknowledge that Moses was divinely appointed by Yahweh, just as in Christian baptism we acknowledge that Jesus was divinely appointed by God to lead us. Remember I told you before, on the Mount of Transfiguration, there's a beautiful picture there where, where Jesus is, is communing with Moses and Elijah. And in the Greek it says, they talked 
of his exodus, his exodus. Jesus was talking to them and said, I'm going to lead captivity captive. I'm taking a host who are hell bound out of here for heaven. Beautiful picture. They all ate, Paul says, the same spiritual or supernatural food. Manna, remember? Manna in the Hebrew. Manna means what is it? It's been described as coriander seed. I would, if you want to try to, I would say probably uh, regular cornflakes, something like that. Manna. And they gathered it every day. Except on the day before the Sabbath. When they gathered twice as much. Because if they went out and gathered it on the Sabbath, guess what they came back with? Worms. It looked like manna. They picked it up, put it in their pots, got back home because they, oh my goodness, I was so busy yesterday, I just didn't get around to do it, but I'm, I'll go ahead and get some, some today. And so they rush out and get it and come back and go, worms. I got serious about this. For 40 years they did this. They all ate the same supernatural food. They all drank the same supernatural fluid. That's what we read from in Exodus. These people grumbled all the time. We've talked about that in, in different studies we've had. Did you bring us out here to kill us? Did you bring us out here to die? I mean, it was hard in Egypt, but at least we had, we had the leeks and the onion. We had something to eat. I mean, it wasn't very, very tasty, but we could always count on something. And now we're out here and we're going to die. Is that what God had in plan? Get us out of Egypt and kill us all in the wilderness. Is that your God, Moses? Grumbled all the time. God provides manna. Well, they got tired of manna. God provides quail. <laughs> These miraculous downpours of quail. I was, I was looking at a video yesterday. I forget where this was. Somewhere. Brazil, I think. Raining spiders. They were, they were panning with a video, and spiders were just everywhere. They had to be attached to something somewhere, but I mean, they looked like they were just coming, just falling from the sky. Well, they had quail in the wilderness. They need to eat. Well, we're thirsty. We're thirsty. Moses said, what am I going to do with these people? They're, they're about to kill me again. God says, well, go to that, that spot I'll tell you about. Take your rod with you. Strike the rock, and water will come from it. Remember that story? He struck the rock, and what happened? Water came from it. Well, they grumbled again later on. This isn't for our study today, but they grumbled again later on. And Moses went to God and God said, speak to the rock. Water will come. There's a Jewish tradition is that this rock just kind of followed them around in the desert. All we know is that, that any time they needed water, the rock was there. All right? Moses goes up to the rock. He is angry, and he strikes the rock again. That's not what God said. God said, speak to the rock. That rock is Christ. And Christ is only smitten once. Once for all struck. And Moses missed it. And it cost Moses. It was that act. God said, you won't see the promised land. So my point here is that God takes these things deadly seriously. And Paul's trying to impress that upon these Corinthians, a New Testament congregation who is, who is expressing uh, troubling issues. So you see, when we, when we look at verse 5, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. It teaches us, listen to this, that it's not enough to be the recipients of divine favors. It's not enough to make a good beginning. That's the application Paul's going to make from this Old Testament picture, I've talked to people, talked to one recently, who wanted to tell me about how God had spared him in a boating accident, spared him from dying, and that that was why he was sure that he was saved. And I said, you know, Paul says in Romans, God's kindness, and this was a kindness of God, 
God's kindness is designed to lead you to repentance. It, I tremble to think how many people have mistaken God's goodness to them as evidence that God has saved them. These people were shown incredible divine favors. It could be argued on the magnitude of them, probably more than any generation's ever seen. They came out celebrating. They plundered the Egyptians when they left, remember? The Egyptians were terrified. I mean, they just had, had death throughout their country. And they're, and they're saying, here, here, oh, go, take this, go. And they, were, they plundered them. They took all, the, all these good things from the Egyptians. Great beginning. Not enough. Jesus said, he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. I don't care if a person was a, was a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, an usher, a preacher, you can go on down the list. If that person is, is apart from the things of God today, that person should tremble. You cannot point to your past and say, well, I was. No, no, no. The Christian language is, by God's grace, I am. By God's grace, I will be. You see this. Someone says that, uh, I think Leon Morris said that this statement, because with most of them, God was not pleased. He said, that's a masterly understatement. <laughs> Since only two men, remember who? Who crossed over? Joshua, Caleb, and their families are the only two who left Egypt now, there were people. You said, weren't there much, a lot more? There were those born in the desert. The only two people who left Egypt and arrived in Canaan, in the Promised Land, were Joshua and Caleb and their families who were alive when they left. Out of millions. It's sobering when you see, when you Jesus say, few there be that find it. When multitudes imagine but they're okay. And Paul is sending a sober warning to Corinth. And he says in verse 6 that these things occurred as an example. The word example there is the word tupos. So we get our word type from that. It comes straight over, transliterated, tupos, type, as a type for us to realize that, that the same God who dealt that way with the Israelites, after the incredible mercies he manifested to them, is the God with whom we deal today, in whom we live and move and have our being, as he said to the folks uh, on Mars Hill. This God. The same thing the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 12. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The same thing Jesus said in Matthew 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, in your name. And I will say, that meant nothing. You lived as if you were your own God. You didn't live as if I was your God. These sobering words that Paul is bringing to bear, they're an example. Charles Hodge says, we shall be conformed to what happened to them if we do not exercise caution. Our doom, he said, will correspond to theirs. So you, you see in this passage here, look, he expands this, this idea of Israel being an example as a warning to us. In fact, the history of Israel, if it's anything, is a warning to Christians. Verse 6, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So we should not set our hearts on evil things. To do that is to incur the wrath of God. Do not be idolaters. Verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, notice this, this is subtle. The people sat down to eat and drink. How'd they do that? Mana and water, supernaturally supplied. They sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, do not be idolaters. 
Don't play with God. Don't toy with God. You think God will accept any old thing we bring? Because I, I hear these preachers sometimes preachers of God's just kind of wringing his hands in heaven, hoping somebody somewhere will pay attention to him and make him look like he might actually be something of a success. That is not the God of heaven and earth. That's not the creator. That's not the God who, who, who struck down the Egyptian people to show his glory and his majesty. That's not God. People that are preachers that are preaching that are preaching a false God. Do not be idolaters. Their idolatry was that they gladly took from God every day. God provided food. They sat down, they ate, they drank, they rose up and did their own thing. Paul calls that to the Corinthians who were in, by the way, who were in the playground of that part of the world. Remember, we told you when we started this study, if you want to insult a woman in Paul's day, you called her a Corinthian woman. Not commit sexual immorality, verse 8, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. Verse 9, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Remember? When they were grumbling again about whom God had appointed over them, and God sent serpents, they were everywhere, snakes. You want to freak me out, throw me in a room of snakes. I, I am sold out to the proposition that God put enmity between me and snakes. I see a snake, I kill it. Then I'll ask them, was it a good snake or not? Was it poisonous or not? Snakes came everywhere in the, in the camp, biting people. They were poisoned. They were dying. God told Moses, erect a standard with a bronze snake on it. And tell them, everyone who looks at the snake will live. Some were crawling there, I imagine. Some were being carried by friends. For a look at the snake hoisted up, they would live. And Jesus said later on, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me. When did he say that? When he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. That was a powerful picture there of looking unto one who can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. You and I know people today who are crawling around poisoned and dying, and they will not look to Jesus to live. Not to murmur, verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Uh, this picture of the angel of death, I think J.B. Phillips uses that term in his, in his translation. Sent by God to bring pestilence. You can look this up in, in Numbers 11, Numbers 14, Numbers 16, there's examples of this. And then verse 11 sums it up. Says it again, what it said earlier. Now these things happened to them as an example, a type, but they were written down for our instruction, for our teaching. Paul's basically saying, are you, are, you, are you teachable? Are you teachable? On whom the end of the ages has come. You're, you're much closer to the end of time than they were. They were trying to survive to get across the Jordan into the promised land. You are coming to the bema. You are coming to the judgment. You're coming to the time when God will blow out history like a candle and roll it up like a scroll and will judge everyone. You're coming to the end of the age. It was written 2,000 years ago, but don't become complacent. Don't become complacent. So in verses 12 and 13, Paul sounds out a solemn warning against overconfidence. Look at this. And then by giving a message of encouragement and cheers. We're going to end on this today. Warning against overconfidence, message of encouragement. Which, by the way, is what the gospel does. Therefore, verse 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. 
The picture there being, if you, if you think you're standing firm, if you think you are secure because of your past, the security of the believer, the preservation of God and salvation is tied inextricably. Read our confession on this. The preservation of the saints is tied inextricably to the perseverance of the saints. So when someone asks, well, so which is it? Does, does God preserve us to the end or do we persevere to the end? The biblical answer is yes. Read our confession. Twin chapters, wonderfully spelled out. He's giving this warning to those who imagine themselves strong because they, were ten, they tended to overconfidence. You need to be careful. Walk humbly. I pray to God, I will die the night before I wake up in the morning to think I can shift my Christian walk into a lower gear. I love that uh, one of the songs from, from the Gaither, Alleluia. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven. My heart overflows because the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. See, it's not the longer I think about it. The longer I think about how long I've been a Christian, it's the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And, and, and Paul is giving a warning here. Do not become complacent. False security of salvation is common. And oftentimes it rests in people who, who would, they would find, well I, well, I belong to church, or I've been a church member all this time, or, or even people who understand the doctrine of election and say, well, I'm one of the elected. Be careful. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Add to your, add to your faith. Just make your calling and election sure. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. See, is my life, my saved life, one that reflects that God is at work in me, working out what He's done in me, so that my life is increasingly conformed to, to His will and pleasing Him? The fall envisioned is, is a moral fall involving, involving personal ruin. And then verse 13 quickly here, so we can wrap this up. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. He said, what's the devil do? What's, the devil lies to us. What's one of his lies? It's a little song he sings to us. Nobody knows. The trouble you've seen, right? Doesn't it? Paul says just the opposite. You haven't faced any temptation that, that, that is not common to being a creature made in the image of God. And then I hear people say, now, God will not lay more on you than you can handle. Write this down. That is a lie. Because see, if you could handle it, you wouldn't need God. Andre Crouch, a black gospel singer, said one time, he said, if we never had any problems, how would we know that God could solve them? God will not lay any more on you than his grace working in you will not give you the strength to bear up under. That's the truth. That's the, so when somebody says that, and maybe you said it, I've said, say, okay, let me, let me clean that language up. When they say that to you, smile at them, you know, don't fuss at them, just smile. Do you understand what they're trying to say? But the truth is, we need God. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, not you are able. The notion behind that is, well, because of God's love for you, he's not going to put more on you than, you than you can bear. He knows what you can handle. No. As Joshua mentioned, his providence unfolds difficulties so that we look to him and find him faithful. 
faithful. And I challenge you to look for any biblical character. Just read any biblical character who experienced this notion that God will not put more on you than you can handle. You think, you think God, that Paul was Superman? No, he was a man who loved God. <laughs> he loved God. When he thought, when he thought it was just all for naught, my grace is sufficient for you. That's what you're looking for. That's the word you want to hear. Wherever you are right now, wherever you find yourself tomorrow, my grace is sufficient for you. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. There you go. You may be pressed. Remember now, God doesn't tempt us. God tests us. Remember James, let no one say when he is tempted that I've been tempted by God, for God is, it does not tempt anyone. God is not tempted himself, nor does he tempt anyone. We're going to look at that in a minute. The encouragement that he wants you to hear. That the hardships experienced by Israel in the wilderness were a part of God's plan to test his people for bringing their true character. Look at Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart. He knows what's in your heart. He tests us so that we can discover what's in our heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. It's like a fellow said one time years ago, he said, you know, you take a tube of toothpaste and if it says crest on it and you squeeze it and mud comes out, you don't go, well, now that's a different looking toothpaste. By the way, there is this, there is this black charcoal toothpaste making the rounds today, which sort of almost messes up the analogy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about toothpaste, the light blue, the red, white, and blue, the blue with sparkles, green, that you squeeze that and you expect toothpaste to come out. When you're squeezed, brothers and sisters, what comes out? Because you see, what, what comes out is what's in, what's inside. And so God tests us that you may know what's inside. And we, and we cleanse that. It's an opportunity for sanctification. If you're not pleased with what's coming out when you're squeezed, then go to work with, with progressive sanctification by the help of the Spirit of God and the ministry of the Word and wash that stuff away. So what Paul is saying to the Corinthians here, and I close with this, is what you're facing there is designed to expose your character so that you can grow in grace. Don't let the devil lie to you. The devil loves to lie. Don't let him do that. Anytime he points out your sin, say, thank you, devil. I need to repent of that. I appreciate you bringing that to my attention because I don't want to carry that around with me. Thank you, devil, for reminding me just how vast is the death of Jesus Christ for me. Thank you for that. I need to go praise Jesus for a while because I, I'm, I've been made more aware now of just how much he took in saving me. Thank you for that. Don't let him play games with you. Thank God, listen to me, thank God that you get exposed to your sin by the love of God and different means so that you can, you can repent of it, be cleansed from it, conquer it, overcome it, lay the ax to the root of it, and go on. That's what Paul is telling these Corinthians here who are having so much trouble with one another. God's designed this to test you. How are you going to come through it? How are you going to come through it? You're going to run from it? You're going to cave under it? Or are you going to rise to worship God? Because he loves you so much. Not only did he send Jesus to die for your sins, to pay the penalty for your sins, to take on his wrath and satisfy his divine justice so that you, by, by grace through faith, would be saved. But he's also sent his spirit who is going to work on you and work on you and work on you and work on you as you completely become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And guess what? Just before you get there, he's going to take you home. He's going to take you home. Say, come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come, 
Welcome, good and faithful servant. We've prepared a place for you. That's how the Christian life works. There is no place for complacency. There is no place for passivity. There is no place for neutral. The devil loves neutral. You shift into neutral, going up a mountain, not good. Not good. So hear what God did in the Israelites, and hear how Paul is taking that and applying that to the Corinthians, because he would apply it the same way to us today in 21st century America. I hate complacency when I discover it in myself. I hate it. Because it goes against the very thing that I say I want. I want to look unto Jesus. I want to run the race that has been marked out for me, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my salvation. I want to get there worn out. I want to get their tongue hanging out. I don't have any notion of just skipping my way to heaven. Isn't it wonderful to walk toward heaven? No. Fight. Every term used in the scripture for sanctification is aggressive. It's aggressive. Jesus said, your hand offends you, cut it off. Your eye offends you, pluck it out. Better to go into heaven maimed than to hell whole. Discover sin? Lay an axe to the root of it. Mortify the deeds of the body. Listen, just look at the language of sanctification. Keep in step with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Do not, do not welcome in the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. All this language. And so, so Paul is pressing that to the Corinthians with the example of the Israelites. My prayer for me and for you is that we will see this huge field of Christian liberty and say, dear God, let me run in this. Let me run in this to your glory. Let me run in this in such a way that, that I'm growing in grace, that I'm looking more like Jesus. Help me to use the liberty purchased for me by Christ, not for me, but for your glory in Christ being made more obvious in me. That's what Paul's talking about here. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you... You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we bow before you now in Jesus' name. And we see this passage and, oh Lord, keep us out of the ditches. There's the ditch of legalism where we look down our noses at others who, who we, we think we're better than them. Keep us out of the ditch of licentiousness where we think we can just do anything we want to do uh, because we have some notion that we've been, that we've been saved sometime in the past, may, the, may, may salvation that has come to us in the past be a growing, present reality. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here that we will run well, that we will finish well. I, I have too many pictures of faces and, and names in my mind of people who began well and who have faded. And your word doesn't leave that in question. Oh, God. Help us, every one of us here, to finish well. For your glory, for the good of our own souls, for the testimony we have to others around us who you've providentially placed in our lives to influence. Help us. Help us. For Jesus' sake, amen.